Aircraft carriers and submarines are the most expensive, sophisticated weapons a nation can possess in its arsenal. And there's nothing in this world that projects more military power than a mobile military air base, or a stealthy, silent killer that carries enough ordnance to reshape a nation's geography. Nowadays, navies use both nuclear and conventional propulsion systems for submarines and aircraft carriers, meaning that they use nuclear reactors or fossil fuel in order to generate power for propulsion and operation of onboard equipment. The US and French Navy operate only nuclear-powered submarines and aircraft carriers. The United Kingdom has only nuclear subs, and India, China and Russia also have nuclear submarines in their fleets. Globally there are only 20 aircraft carriers, and 12 of them, or 60%, are nuclear-powered. And as some of you may know, Australia has recently cancelled its 12 diesel-electric submarines order from France in favor of a nuclear-powered alternative from the US and the UK. But why some of the most powerful navies in the world choose to have nuclear-powered submarines and aircraft carriers? Nuclear propulsion uses reactors that heat up water to produce steam, which is then used for thrust and electrical power. And the reactors provide enough energy for 20-25 years meaning that submarines and carriers have unlimited range for decades without having to refuel. But for carriers, range has never been that big of an issue. Conventional carriers like the HMS Queen Elizabeth of the Royal Navy can travel up to 19,000 kilometers without refueling. That's almost halfway around the world. Instead, nuclear-powered carriers don't need to carry fossil fuel on board for themselves, and don't have exhaust stacks, combustion air pipes, or shock-reducing systems like conventional carriers, meaning that nuclear propulsion systems require less space. So nuclear-powered carriers can store more jet fuel weapons or other high-value goods than conventional carriers of the same size and air wing capacity. Basically, the extra storage space makes a nuclear carrier able to deliver more impact because it can launch more sorties from its deck. To put it into perspective, a Nimitz-class nuclear carrier stores 90% more aviation fuel and 50% more ordnance than a Forrestal-class conventional carrier, and both have similar-sized airway. Plus the fact that reactors don't have to be refueled for decades also reduces the logistical efforts required to operate such a complex ship. See given their role and characteristics, regardless of the propulsion type, once carriers leave their home ports, they become targets. So they never travel alone, they have to sail in strike groups. Generally, a U.S. carrier strike group consists of two guided missile destroyers, a guided missile cruiser, a nuclear attack submarine, and a support ship. The role of the support ship is to replenish the strike group during deployment, so it goes from port to port to get supplies. It doesn't have any offensive or defensive roles like the rest of the group. And since the aircraft carrier and the submarine are nuclear-powered, so they don't have to be refueled, there's more fuel on the support ship to go around for the rest of the strike group that does need fossil fuel to operate. This is a major strategic advantage because the strike group can stay on deployment for longer periods of time and is less dependent on foreign oil. Moreover, nuclear-powered carriers have catapult launch systems rather than ramps that are able to accelerate the aircrafts from 0 to 165 knots in just 2.5 seconds. The catapult is operated by high-pressured steam that comes from the reactors. Conventional carriers don't generate high-pressured steam so they have to rely on ramps for aircraft that are capable of vertical or short takeoffs. When it comes to submarines, the story with nuclear propulsion is a bit different. While a carrier cannot and should not hide its position because its mere presence sends a clear message of power, with submarines everything is based on stealth and secrecy. Nicknamed Silent Service, not being seen as the submarine's main defense and goal. Submarines are able to deploy a variety of lethal weapons without warning, to sink other submarines, ships, or to attack land targets. They can also gather intelligence right from the adversary's coast, or serve as surveillance and reconnaissance platforms. All this has to be done while being invisible. The bottom line is that if the enemy can't find the sub, then they can't sink it, and it has the best chances to go undetected when it's submerged deep down underwater. So a sub hides under the protection of deep cold salty water that acts like a very thick layer, bouncing back enemy sonar waves without hitting it and exposing its position. When a sub is no longer in cold water or has to resurface, it is vulnerable to enemy attacks because it's very easy to locate. And this is where the propulsion type comes into play and makes the difference. Conventional submarines are powered by a diesel-electric aggregate similar to a hybrid vehicle that relies on oxygen to function. The diesel engine is basically a generator. It charges the batteries which power the electric motors that run the propeller in order to put or to keep the submarine in motion. But the batteries will eventually discharge, so the submarine has to snorkel or surface for air frequently to start up the diesel engine to do a battery charge. This process puts the sub at risk of being detected both by radar and sonar, plus the diesel engine is loud so is even more exposed. The record for the longest ever submerged transit for diesel-electric submarines without snorkeling. 
is just 18 days, and it was established in 2013 by a Type 212 submarine of the German Navy while it was heading to a naval exercise in U.S. waters. Nuclear-powered subs on the other hand don't depend on air intake. Because they don't have to surface for air, they can operate indefinitely completely submerged in the safety of cold waters. This is essential in maintaining maximum stealth. But even though the reactors provide energy for 20-25 years, nuclear submarines cannot stay forever underwater. The food supply they can carry on board lasts for a maximum of 90 days. Plus they still need maintenance for various systems, or even for the reactors, and have to go back to port for repairs. So their sea endurance is limited by the food supply and maintenance work. But it's not just for how long subs can stay submerged that's important. Also critical is how fast they can transit areas while submerged. And once again, nuclear-powered subs have the upper hand because they cruise at greater speeds. A U.S. Navy Ohio-class nuclear submarine has a cruise speed of 37 kilometers per hour. This means that with a single load of supplies it can make the round trip from New York to Liverpool seven times, or go around the world twice without having to surface once. While cruising at this speed conventional or diesel-electric subs can operate submerged for only several tens of kilometers. The faster they go, the faster the batteries will discharge and the shorter their range will get. So in order to maximize their range they have to preserve the energy stored in their batteries. And when in complete submersion they usually cruise at a speed of just 8 kilometers per hour. The Royal Australian Navy's Collins-class subs have a maximum speed of 39 kilometers per hour in complete submersion. Cruising at this speed, their batteries will last for a sprint of only 60 kilometers, while at 7.4 kilometers per hour, their operational range increases up to 890 kilometers. Nuclear energy also made possible the construction of larger submarines thanks to the constant high output of power delivered by the reactors. Nuclear subs are almost double in length than the largest conventional submarine ever built, the Chinese King-class sub at 92.6 meters long. By comparison, Ohio and Bore classes are 170 meters long, and the Typhoon-class subs are 175 meters long. The difference in size means that nuclear submarines carry more firepower, even nuclear warheads. And alongside their higher speed and the capability of very long deployments, these warships are able to operate a much wider spectrum of missions than conventional ones. The biggest difference is that nuclear submarines play an offensive role by being specifically designed for deep-sea operations and to serve as nuclear deterrent. Conventional subs on the other hand are more suitable for close-to-shore operations and to defend the coastline. And obviously, nuclear propulsion isn't perfect and it has its downsides. First, it is extremely expensive. For the price of a single nuclear submarine, you can buy about four conventional, if not even five. And for carriers it's the same. The Gerald R. Ford class was about $13 billion, while the HMS Queen Elizabeth came with a price tag of $3.5 billion, so it was almost four times cheaper to build. Nuclear warships are more expensive not just because they have reactors. This type of propulsion requires extra safety systems so that the vessel survives wartime attacks, and also to protect its crew members from radioactivity-related hazards. Then there's the complexity of building a nuclear vessel. It requires specialized shipyards that have the capacity and capability to put together this type of ship safely and suitably, and also specialized personnel to design, build and operate the reactors, meaning the navies have to have schools to train qualified nuclear engineers and other qualified manpower for this classified field. The problems France faced with the Charles de Gaulle nuclear carrier are the best examples that showcased how important experience is in building these type of warships. Her construction began in 1987 and entered service 14 years later in 2001, but it was five years past schedule. The construction was suspended four times due to insufficient funding, and money weren't the only problem. Also the lack of experience in building nuclear ships led to a poor quality construction. After she entered sea trials the French Navy realized they had to extend the flight deck because it was too short for the E2C Hawkeye. Then there was a smoke incident when a reactor triggered the combustion of isolation elements, and also one of the propellers broke. So the ship quickly became a financial black hole full of technical issues. On top of all of this when she finally was ready to be sent on deployment, French media reported that there wasn't enough qualified personnel to operate it. Another caveat when talking about nuclear vessels is that at the end of their long life cycle, these ships are also decommissioned. But scrapping a nuclear vessel is a headache. This process requires a dedicated disposal facility. Then the reactors have to be stored in remote locations far away from populated areas. The U.S. Navy dismantles the ships here at Puget Sound Naval Base Washington and then ships the reactors by river to the Hanford Tank Waste Treatment and Immobilization Plant to store them. The spent nuclear fuel is removed from the reactors and sealed in dry casts, then placed for several years in a deep pool for cooling. Once cooled down, and after losing some of its radioactivity, it's then stored on site. 
The defueled reactor compartment is sealed at both ends and put in dry storage, and only then is buried. The trenches where the reactors are buried are evaluated to be secure for several thousand years before any leaks might occur. Both the US and Russia store their reactor components in similar fashion. The whole process of decommissioning a nuclear vessel is not only slow, but is also extremely expensive. The cost for storing the spent nuclear fuel and reactors for the USS Enterprise is approximately $1 billion up to $1.5 billion and can take up to 10 years to complete. Bearing in mind that the Earth is mostly covered by water and with most of the world's population living within 100 miles of the sea, an aircraft carrier is considered to be the most valuable military asset, being a massive mobile airfield with worldwide mobility. Thereby having access to almost any area of a potential crisis, a carrier is able to project air power around the globe. The ballistic missile submarines are designed for stealth and for the precise delivery of nuclear warheads. Also, forming one of the three arms of the nuclear triad, they operate as very effective deterrent to nuclear conflict, meaning that they have the best chances to survive a first nuclear strike and then be ready to retaliate with full force. So if the enemy cannot disable the opponent's weaponry, then is less likely to launch a nuclear attack because it will suffer the consequences.